Um, first of all, thank you everyone for showing up. Um, I hope you are as excited as I am to listen about some um, women in science and especially in the Wikipedia. That is what I do. <laughs> so my name is Maria Fernando Veloz. Uh, Marifer is the contraction of both of my names because I'm Latin American. So Marifer for short, and that's actually also my username. So you can find me in the Wiki projects as Marifer Veloz, um, also in, in social media. And I am a scientist myself. Um, I am by training a chemist and currently I'm doing a PhD in neuroscience. So I'm very passionate about scientists and about their representation in different platforms. And I think Wikipedia is, is one of them that can allow us to make them visible to a lot of people in the world. And that's what I'm going to talk today um, with you. Um, so of course, I'm Mexican and I focus my project in Mexican women in science. And just to start, I want to show you some statistics. Um, the female population in Mexico, 51% is female. And this is this is great, you know, because we are a big country. We are around 128 um, Mexicans and 51% of women. So that's that's really good. And we want them to to become and to, to go into the, the STEM careers. Um, and from the 100% of researchers that belong to the um, Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, you will see this acronym SNI, which is the National System of Researchers um, in Mexico. 37%, according to the data in um, 2023 are female. So this has been good. It has been an increase. Um, actually, this year, 2024, it marks 40 years of this program being in place. And when it started, it started with a 12% of women being in the, uh, in the national program of researchers. So over 40 years, we have increased up to the 37%, which is not yet the 50%, but it's, it's increasing and, and it's maintaining um, in there. Now, also, more Mexican women are being interested into studying um, STEM-related careers. Uh, for example, in the school year of 2019-2020, in UNAM, which is the National University of Mexico, 55.6% of women enrolled into, into a STEM career. And that involves biological sciences, engineering, and computer science, which is an, an area in the sciences that we don't see a lot of women, but we, we start to see them. Um, for the 100% of the females uh, population, the 65% of them are in biological sciences, chemistry, or medical related fields. So we start here to see kind of like a trend of like women still going for like things related to service and care for others, and this kind of things. Um, and we see that only the 33% go to what we sometimes call the hard sciences. And I'm making quote quote because that doesn't necessarily mean that the other sciences are not hard, but this is physics, mathematics, and engineering. And that's one third of the student population in, in UNAM. Um, I took UNAM as an example, but this kind of statistics replicate across different universities or the main universities in, in our country. Um, and it also replicates worldwide. So UNESCO displayed um, um, inform on 2021 about the status of women in science worldwide. And they discovered that around the 100% of people that have PhDs, 40% of them are women, which represents more or less one third of the, of the scientific researchers uh, worldwide. Um, in, in the fields of biological sciences and medical sciences, we have achieved what they call like, um, like an equality. So almost 50% or even more of the researchers in these areas are, are women. So that's that's pretty good. But still, we are kind of like back in the terms of physics, mathematics, and engineering with only 28% of the experts in these fields being females. Um, this replicates worldwide. And of course, there are countries that have more researchers than others because of the development of the country itself. But Overall, that's how the, the numbers um, look around. And we see um, that as women start progressing in, in the scientific field and in academia, they start facing more issues. So it's great to see that women are enrolling into universities. It's great to see that most of them are getting PhDs, that they go to different things, but still they are facing more problems. And these are, I'm gonna show you two concepts that we hear a lot, but it doesn't hurt anyone to kind of like refresh them. And the first of them is the pyramid effect which refers to the phenomenon where as women advance in their scientific career, their numbers decrease. It becomes harder and harder to keep 
becoming a better scientist or keep escalating this academic wall, which can be very, very difficult. And this also comes with the glass ceiling and more important, the glass walls. So the glass ceiling represents the difficulties that women uh, face accessing dignified working conditions and protect them from precariousness, um, informality, and, and poverty. And it's called the glass ceiling because we don't always see it because there's no laws, there's nothing, um, protocols in the universities or in the institutions that allows us to see what's, what's above us. So it's just like this kind of thing. But more, more importantly, and this is a thing that I discovered recently, are the glass walls that represents the barriers that are not only above us to keep escalating the wall, but also at, at, in our side, um, that keeping us far from being part of um, decision-making teams and being in, more, more, more involved in higher um, steps of the academic hierarchy which, like it or not, academia is still a very hurtful place. Um, and we see this, an example, as postgraduate fellowships. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with how the academia works, usually you enroll into university, you decide to stay in academia, to go into grad school, and you obtain your PhD. But if you want to continue in academia and become a professor or a researcher and have your own lab, you need to do a, post a postdoctoral fellowship. And it's Again, academia can be toxic, so and that can be a whole different lecture. But it's important for a lot of universities to to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship abroad, somewhere else that is not your country. Um, ideally, somewhere else that is not your university. But the best of it is that it's in another country. Um, and for this, people need a scholarship, especially coming from countries like Mexico, where it's not the same spending in Mexican pesos than spending in U.S. dollars if you want to come to the U.S. for for a postdoc um, or somewhere in Europe. And that's why we need we need fellowships, we need scholarships. And according to, to the latest statistics in 2023, um, they were granted 50 from the 100 percent of the scholarships, 55 percent were granted for men to stay in Mexico to do to do a postdoc in Mexico and 44 percent um, to women. Whereas like to go abroad, to go to any other country in the world that you want to apply, 40 percent were given to women and almost 60 percent were given to men. So still we 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 start to see this difference a bit more significant on how are men more awarded than women. Um, and then we see um, how they belong to the national um, researcher system, the SNI, um, me in, in Spanish, 37% are women versus the 63 that are men. So we see here, as far as we are like trying to climb up the ladder, it's becoming more difficult. Like if you want to stay in Mexico to do your, your postdoc, okay, it's difficult, but it's likely doable. You want to go abroad? Mm, it's slightly more difficult. You want to become an experienced researcher, part of the national program. It's even more difficult to do that. And and this is because, um, okay, I'm, before we go there, I will explain you how the national researchers thing work. And, and just to go a bit deeper into the, into the numbers, it works in four different levels, actually five, because level three and emeritus are two different, but we usually englobe them in one. So candidate is right after you finish your PhD and you start working in an institution, you become a candidate. You are recognized by the government that you are a researcher and they pay you very little, like it's like minimum wage. So that's very little. And that's 26% of the, the researchers that, that stay in Mexico. Um, you can be part of the national researcher program, but they only pay you if you live in Mexico. So if you live abroad, you just get this fancy title that in other countries, it really means nothing, but you can get it if you get your PhD. Um, but then you can you can apply after being a candidate for two three years. You can apply into level one, which is an earlier career researcher, um, in which you need to have a postdoctoral fellowship to go into this. So if you were never awarded a scholarship to do a postdoc, then you will never be able to reach level one, and not even level two or three, right? Um, but in this level, we have we have a lot of researchers because people get to manage somehow to do a postdoctoral fellowship. So we have more than fifty percent of the of the researchers that are in this level. And the reason is because a lot of people stay there for many years because it becomes more difficult to keep growing. So when it's level two, you need to have around fifteen years of experience in the academia. You need to have a lot of papers published in big journals. You need to have um, awards and international experiences. If you don't have money, you cannot achieve this. So numbers start to decrease again, 14%. And then level three in emeritus, it's like the biggest part. 
So it's only for like, actually emeritus, you can only get it if you're over 65 years old. And that's why they usually put them together because it's so difficult. It really requires a lifelong academic career. And we see the numbers are only um, 7% for, for this. These numbers are... Um, anyway, and why does this happen? Why women have more problems uh, starting to, to climb up this academic ladder and, and be there? Well, we, we have here heard about this uh, multiple times. Um, most of that is harassment, especially in the workplace by either supervisors or colleagues. The absence of protocols to address um, any discrimination or gender-based um, issues. The absence of visibility by institutions, by governments, and by the society. Women feel that they, if they're not recognized by their work, they stop trying. They are like, why am I going to keep doing this if no one is seeing my work? Um, and low representation, especially as they climb up the ladder in the decision-making bodies, they're not represented. And then they stop trying and they don't want to be there anymore. And of course, the family limitations, um, the surgical genders, and the lack of support um, mechanisms that they have. So what should we do? So there are always like a lot of things and what, what can we do? First of all, I mean, we need to implement talent retention methods because we see that people are like, girls are going into university and they're yeah. using academic career, um, scientific fields for, for a career. But they after that, they, they don't continue in academia. They either move to other fields, they either do something something else because it's so difficult to plan this ladder. Um, we need to eliminate uh, gender stereotypes, which I think as um, I think Mexico and Latin America in general has been doing a great job in trying to, to break these stereotypes. Also transform relationships um, between the educational and the workspace and introduce the laws. But not, not all of this is in our hands, right? Like we, we cannot, I mean, I think none of us are politicians, so there are like certain limitations, you know, on, on what we can do. Um, but we can be part of, of different things. Um, for example, the UN has the Sustainable Development Goals. And the goal number five is gender equality, which includes the approval and strengthening of regulations and projects um, for gender equality and empowerment of girls. So they are thinking about it. They're like, we need to do something about this. And number 10 is reducing inequalities, which focuses on providing guarantees for equal opportunities and reducing inequalities in both laws, practices, and public actions. So there are things that, that can be done, like people have heard, and there are things that, that we, we need to do. And in Mexico, we have we have different projects. We have um, the U.S. Mexico Leaders Network, um, or Red de, de Lideresas eh, Mexico Estados Unidos, uh, which is a, a program that supports young women in upper secondary education that wish to pursue a STEM career, and they help them like they have to demonstrate that they are leaders and that they are proactive, and then they like kind of like teach them a set of skills that will allow them to to go into universities. Um, the good thing about this program is that sometimes uh, the girls are so good that they even get scholarships to come to the U.S. and study their, their career here, which, which is great for them. Um, and another program is Movimiento STEM, or Movement STEM, uh, which promotes the teaching of science, technology, and engineer, engineering and mathematics, making it like pillars for sustainable development and social well-being. So these programs are great, and people are doing things. But there are, there, are, there are limitations with these programs because you can only participate when you are a certain age. You can only participate if your parents can take you to these places and you can attend the meetings. Sometimes it's expensive. If you want to come to the US, you need to take a visa. And taking a visa can take up to two years in Mexico to, to make all those documents. So these projects are great and they're doing great into getting girls into university, but they, they have the limitations. And that's where Wikipedia comes in use. So we, I found in Wikipedia a great tool to, to make women visible, to help them reach audiences, to change this mindset of, of girls who, who are intending to study a career. Um, and, and this kind of like came, when I was in college, I used to do a lot of scientific um, outreach um, events. And we, I usually like to start by asking the people there, how do you imagine a scientist? And the answer I got 90% of the time was like, oh, it's an old man who has a white coat, uses glasses, and has his hair all like not very well, you know? Which kind of like reminds us of, of that photo of Albert Einstein, right? But it was always a man with a lab coat. And, and that means that they, they have this, this idea, right, in gray. 
But when we use Wikipedia, we get the chance to change that perspective. We get the chance to, to show people that a scientist doesn't necessarily need to be a man. It can be also a woman. It can be a transgender person. Um, it can have the hair white, blue, red, <laughs> whatever color you want. Um, and, and changing this, um, th this is this is stereotypes, these ideas of scientists. Like I think for me, it's very important. And Wikipedia has given me the this case to to do that because I mean, as we all know, we can reach global um, broader audiences. Um, we make information information more accessible, and most important, it's free for everyone who has an internet connection. So although it's not easy for everyone in the world to have internet, it's much more easier than going every single week they commuting to different places to be part of this somehow selective groups of leaders to, to be part of a STEM career. Um, there are several initiatives uh, made by Wikimedians or group of Wikimedians. One of them is Edita Donna, which some of you have heard, which is the female version of an edit-a-thon in which women, um, this is an initiative from Wikimedia Mexico, in which women get together to and learn how to edit Wikipedia and they it's a safe space for women editing about women or women related topics. So this is, this is a very safe space and they have done very good to, to, to improve the, the content related to women. Um, Wiki Women in Red is the project that Rosie um, created a few years ago. And again, it's focused on creating and improving Wikipedia articles of underrepresented uh, women in, in Wikipedia, in this platform. Um, and lately, and the last year in the Wiki Women camp, they, they've come up, a group of women can have come up with this idea of creating a wiki women task force, which is dedicated um, to to the to increase the representation of women across all the Wikimedia projects. But one of the goals, this project is still on creation, but I think it has a good spirit because they are trying to put more women into the decision making bodies of the Wikimedia projects. And I think this is important because the same way as in academia, is it becomes more difficult to get and to climb this ladder. The same thing is, is kind of what we face in Wikipedia. And, and I think that's why the work that the Wiki Women Task Force is aiming to do, um, it's, it's really important. And part of it is that the project that I created, which is Wiki Científicas Mexicanas or Wiki Women in Science, Wiki CMX for abbreviation. And the purpose of my project is to enhance the visibility and the representation of Mexican women scientists in Wikipedia by creating new biographies and by improving the biographies that, that we have. Um, improving not only in terms of knowing what the scientist has done, like uh, what her life has been, but also in the part of the research they have done. What are the main areas of the research? Maybe linking those articles with the article of the plant or the animal or the bacteria that they study, because we know that this like linking articles can help us get there. So the more you link it and the more you connect these kind of things, the broad, broader the audience you, you get. And again, we start changing the perspective of like people when they think what a scientist looks like. Um, so this is the project, Wiki Scientificas Mexicanas, which through the creation, but also the translation and editing of biography, because sometimes we see that people kind of like create biographies and, and they put it and they put it out there, but they are like really small. They don't have like one paragraph being like, oh yeah, she is a biologist and she studies um, this plant and she has got, won this award. And you know, that's that's not really, really great. Um, or sometimes they put a lot of information that is not important. It was uh, one of the first articles that I edited about um, a science communicator in, in Mexico. She's very popular. She has two PhD honoris causa. Um, she does a great job, has written like seven books about science uh, communication. And the Wikipedia article had a whole section about who his father, her father was and who the, the brothers and, and siblings were, which bear in mind, none of them were famous. None of them had done anything important. They were not politicians, they were nothing, but they had a whole paragraph there. And it was like, why, why is this important? I, I don't care who her father is. Like, I mean, maybe it, she's the daughter of Albert Einstein or whatever. Okay, yeah, we can blue link it, but it's not. So we, we try to incorporate this gender perspective into, into the profiles of women. Um, these are some of the examples of the editatonas that we have done. We've done several of them, always um, choosing a theme, um, science related or underrepresented group. And we kind of like edit about the theme, but also about the women that work in that field, but also about the theme. For example, the late, uh, one of the latest we did was about um, earth sciences. So we edited about institutions, about volcanoes, about craters, about 
scientist that works in, in the earth science field. We did one um, about gaming. So we this was basically programmers, computer scientists, animators, people that are like in that field, which was slightly difficult because there are not a lot of women in this field. So that was that was a challenging one. Um, then we did a general one on all Mexican women in science. We also edited about indigenous Mexican women and Afro-descendant that were related to, to the field. And this, this editathon was really special. Before it, we had um, a panel in which we invited five um, indigenous and Afro-descendant Mexican scientists, and they talked to us about their experiences. And it was, it was really, really enriching to, to, hear, to hear them, how they are like poorly represented, even, even more than the rest of the women. Um, we did one editathon about chemistry in Latin America, and this we did with a group of scientists called Latinx Chem, uh, which is uh, a group of scientists in all Latin America. So in this one, we edited in English, Spanish, and Portuguese Wikipedia. It was our first editathon in multiple languages Wikipedia, and our only one, by the way. Um, one we did with the Embassy of Australia in Mexico about Mexican women that have had the opportunity to go and study in Australia but also Australian scientists that have had the opportunity to come and study in Mexico, because Mexico is also a great country. And um, surprisingly, a lot of Australians like to come to Mexico because we have a lot of diversity in our beaches. So a lot of biologists love to come to our country to study. For instance, we have uh, one of the highest populations of uh, turtles in different species. So a lot of, um, especially marine scientists, decide to, to come to our country to study. And we did the reactions as well. Um, another one about uh, Mexican women in science. Yeah, another two of Mexican women in science um, in general. So these are some of the of the editathons that, that we have done. And overall, we have edited and created more than 200 biographies. And we have, um, they have been seen, the articles have been read more than 100,000 times, which it's great. I think that number represents a lot because that means that 100,000 times people saw that a scientist is not a man with a lab coat, glasses, and a white hair. They saw that a woman can be all of that. They can be programmers, they can be miners, they can be geographers, they can be uh, chemists, they can be whatever they, they want, and they sometimes they are Afro-descendant. So I think that, that, was, that was really nice. Um, and last year in, in February, we came up, came up with this idea of making a photography campaign um, which was called Nosotras en la Ciencia, which is us in science, but in Spanish we have us as a female version, which is Nosotras. Um, and it was it was launched to document the women scientists in their multiple facets, because scientists not only are in the lab or in the field, they can also be presenting, they can also be taking care of the kids, they can be in um, in a sci uh, scientific outreach event. So we wanted to, to capture these images of women in, in the different facets and upload them to, to Wikimedia Commons. This campaign was open through the whole month of February, because February is the month of women in science, according to the UN. 11 of February is the International Day of Girls and Women in Science. So kind of like to celebrate that day, we decided to make it all February about, about women in science. And at the end of the event, we we concluded with an editatona about Mexican women in science. Um, for this event, it was our first time running this kind of campaign. So I was first. I was very stressed. I thought no one was going to participate. <laughs> but at the end, we got eighty-eight photos, which was, I guess, a, a good number. Um, uploaded in, in Wikimedia Commons. We created five new articles in the Spanish Wikipedia, and we edited sixteen more. Um, in the edit, in the um, editathon, we had fourteen editors participating. So that means that editors work at least in one article, one of them, which was like fully completed and, and it was there in the platform. So I guess also this was this was really, really interesting. Um, and another of the things that I like a lot to do is social media. Um, I'm not very good at it, but I try my best. <laughs> and when this project started, it was part of like a joint project between Wikimedia Mexico and I was part at that time of a group of women called Mexican Women in Science, basically. Uh, but then a lot of bureaucratic and political things happen and the group kind of like dissolved. But together, I, I continue, of course, with the project and Wikimedia Mexico has been kind enough to, to support me in this. And when we were in this group of, uh, of Mexican scientists, we created several posts 
uh, on what is Wikipedia, what are the myths of Wikipedia, why should we use Wikipedia in education, how to edit Wikipedia, why Wikipedia is open access, and so on and so forth. And these are some of the of the posts that we have um, we have posted, and all the the social media um, you can find it across different platforms with the hashtag WikiCMX. That is kind of like the contraction of the of the project. And in my personal social media, I also like to talk a lot about Wikipedia, and I kind of like post try to post some either content like this or reels talking talking about that. And I think I think it's important as well. So what's next? We need to continue uh, making women visible, and Wikipedia is a great tool for us. So we want to repeat this photo campaign. We saw that we we got a bit more reach than what we thought. I honestly thought we were going to have five photos. So we had 88. I think it's a good number. We can aim for 100 next year. Um, so yeah, um, make it. And I will also like to include more chapters or user groups to be part of this campaign. Because having the photos of scientists is so important because you you not only like are reading the, the, the biography, you're also seeing how they look like. And most of the time, you can be surprised that like scientists are quite young. Like they 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 not necessarily are like all the women, especially the, the ones we edit, we try to include scientists from different, like all ages pretty much. Um so this is very this is very important for me. Um and I would like to to include and invite other chapters and user groups to be part of, of this initiative for our next February. So prepare your cameras, start taking photos. <laughs> um of course you've editing, create more editathons. That's that's one of the things that we also want to want to keep doing. Keep, um, improving the content in, in Wikipedia about it. Um, and do some research. I, as, as I said at the beginning, I am a scientist myself. I'm a researcher and I would like to, to see, and I tried my best to do it for this presentation, but I honestly didn't have the tools um, to do so. But I would like to have an update on the statistics on women's representation of Wikipedia a bit more in depth. There have been some papers about um, how frequent it is that the female articles are tagged as easy for deletion. They have been some, but they always use the statistics that we had from many years ago saying that only 16% of women um, have their biographies in Wikipedia. And I am sure we have changed those numbers. I think, especially if you remember the initiatives that many Wikimedians have done, I think we have made a change. So I've actually would like to, to do some, some deep research on, on this kind of things and kind of like update our, our statistics there. Um, and finally, keep networking. Um, I think Wikipedia is very collaborative, and we all love to collaborate. We all love to interact with one another. So I would like to expand my project, collaborate with other um, chapters, user groups, and try to like expand our editions in different languages. Because in editing in the Spanish Wikipedia, it's great, and it's our main goal. But also, once an article is translated into for example, English Wikipedia or Chinese like Wikipedia, then it's easier for broader populations to keep translating those articles to their own languages, to like, I don't know, African languages that I've discovered in this past Wikimania, but there are a lot of African languages and they're so cool, um, or German or stuff like that. So yeah, collaboration, it's, it's always good. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, your patience, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Here's my email address and my handles for social media. So, yeah, happy to take it. <laughs> Jamie, hi. Uh, I really love that you guys are having like women in science doing everything. But I know personally, working at a science institution, there's a major lack of women, but also anyone in the lab that we're missing photos of. Like, there's a lot of stock images, and I feel like if you know anything about lab work, you look at them and you're like, that person doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. So, um, I, would, I know myself and John Sadowski, who works at National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, you ever want to collaborate on uploading pictures of people in labs, but especially women in labs? <laughs> we would love to be a part of that. Great. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's, it's really interesting because um, one of my colleagues from, from my lab, he participated in the campaign, and he really likes photography. So in, in my lab, we are mostly women. So he was like, oh, great, let me just take some photos. 
And, and it was so fun because he wanted to go into the cell culture room and take some photos there. But it was like, you cannot bring your camera into the cell culture room. Like you're here to contaminate the whole thing. So he was like outside and he tried like his best to, to get the shot. And that's something you didn't see in, I don't know, Flickr or something like that. When you go into there, you see, um, actually one of the images that I found here, I think it's the first one, the girl that is holding the beaker, she's not wearing gloves. And I was like, this is catch burning wrong, but okay. <laughs> We're just gonna keep it there. But yeah, no, taking taking actually good photos. And and that's the way people can see the reality of a lab mm -hmm. that, that we as scientists, we I remember once I <laughs> recorded a reel in my lab, it was like just something funny, whatever. And I had my hair down, and all my friends commented on that reel, like, man, your hair is down, you're not wearing gloves. And I was like, come on, guys, it was just like a reel for fun. But that's that's what we need to do. That's what like real scientists do. We have our hair up and we use gloves. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else? Come on. <laughs> no. If not, I would like to thank you again. I don't see anything in the chat. So thank you everyone for